Have you ever wondered what it was like right before the Great Depression started? I remember, from a very young age, being fascinated by that question and what life was like during the Great Depression. How did things go from being so incredibly good to so devastatingly bad so quickly? I would sit there and I would ask my grandpa these questions to see if he had any answers to talk about how the money just disappeared. People were rich, they had abundance, and then suddenly they had nothing. And he would do his best to describe to me the mechanisms and valuation and what the stock market was, and most of it, as a young child, just went straight over my head. And for most people, they don't want to consider that when times are good, things could change in the blink of an eye and economic pain might be right around the corner. But it's a historical reality that some of the most economically painful times are preceded immediately by times of fake abundance. So, if you want to know what it looked like right before the Great Depression, look around. Because the reality is that everything that's happening around us right now, economically speaking, both from a theory perspective and from a historical pattern perspective, is flashing warning signs of economic danger ahead. So, first the theory, the boom-bust cycle. Let's break it down in simpler terms. Imagine a small, self-contained town where everyone has some gold stored in a local bank. This gold represents their savings and is like their money. Before the bank introduced a new service called lending, if someone in the town wanted to borrow money, it had to be money that someone else in the town wasn't using at that time. For example, if John wanted to borrow from Sally, Sally couldn't spend the money she lent him until he paid it back. This kept things stable. People saved, spent and borrowed based on their own needs and choices. But when the bank started offering loans, things changed. They began creating paper money out of thin air, not backed by the gold they held. This meant they could lend money to people without giving up any of their own gold. They could also offer lower interest rates than others in town. So, people started borrowing more because the interest rates were attractive. For instance, someone might borrow money to fix their roof or build an addition to their house. This meant that workers like construction workers and roof builders suddenly had more money coming in. They, in turn, spent that money on things like new shoes or bags for their spouses. This increased spending created income for others in the town and the money circulated throughout the local economy. Now, let's understand and simplify the concept of what happens when money is lent into existence and its consequences. Imagine you're in a town where people start borrowing a lot of money. This makes everyone feel like things are going great and they see their incomes go up. But here's the catch. This feeling of prosperity is built on borrowed money, which eventually needs to be paid back. When people start repaying those loans, it signals the end of good times and the start of tough times. Now, the banker in town has two choices. Choice one, the banker can lower interest rates again to keep the cycle going. This means people can borrow even more money to pay off their old debts, and the cycle continues. More money enters the town, and things seem great for a while. But this can't last forever. Eventually, prices shoot up, and if the banker keeps lowering rates and flooding the town with more money, it can lead to a disaster. People lose trust in the money, rush to the bank to get whatever valuable assets are left, and everything falls apart. During this time, People make strange decisions because of all the extra money in town, and some prices become much higher than they should be. This can lead to problems. Choice two, the banker can decide to do something else. When the prices start rising too fast, the banker can increase interest rates instead of lowering them. This makes it harder for people to borrow new money, and they have to focus on paying off their old debts. This might sound good, but it has its problems too. It can cause economic pain because paying off debts becomes more expensive. The banker keeps raising interest rates until people start paying off their debts, but the damage is already done. People made decisions during the good times that they wouldn't have made without all that extra money around. This is a bit like finding out that something was wrong during the good times and it becomes clear when things start going bad. 
So, the damage is actually done during the good times when people make decisions based on the wrong information caused by changes in interest rates and the amount of money in circulation. Now, how does all of this happen in the real world? Imagine you have a chart showing something called the Federal Funds Effective Rate. This is basically how much it costs for banks to borrow money from the big central bank called the Federal Reserve. It's a bit like our earlier story about the town bank. Back in 2001, when things weren't going so well in the economy, the Federal Reserve decided to make it. Easier for banks to borrow money. This was supposed to help the economy, but it didn't work out as planned. Instead, it led to people making not-so-great investments and using resources in the wrong way, like when the housing bubble happened before the big financial crisis. But instead of letting things sort themselves out, the Federal Reserve did something unusual. They kept lowering the cost of borrowing money all the way down to zero. They were worried about the economy, so they tried to help by making money super cheap to borrow. They did this for a few years until they started raising rates again in 2016. But in 2020, they got scared that the economy might struggle, so they went back to zero interest rates. During all of this, they also started creating a lot of new money, which is like printing more money. And in 2021, prices for things started going up a lot, inflation. And the Federal Reserve tried to stop this by raising interest rates faster than they ever had before. Now. Here's the tricky part. Even though they've been raising interest rates to get people to borrow less money, the big problem is that it hasn't started working yet. The government has been borrowing a ton of money and so have regular people. But because interest rates are going up and the printing of new money is slowing down, there's actually less money in the economy now. This is happening faster than it has in a long time, almost like what happened during the Great Depression. So. According to the theory we talked about earlier, we should start seeing signs that things are not going well. These signs include prices about to drop, too much of certain things, and people making investments that might not turn out so great. This happens because the information about the economy was kind of messed up by the changes in how much money there is. And guess what? We are starting to see these signs right now. For example, there are a lot of cars sitting around unsold and some car prices are dropping by a lot. Think about how just a little while ago, it was hard to find a car to buy, and now prices are falling by thousands of dollars. Most American car companies are having a tough time, but one company, Fiat, is having an especially tough time. They have hundreds of dealerships all over the country, but they've sold fewer cars this year than they have dealerships. This makes us wonder about the parent company, Stellantis. It's not just cars, even fancy things like Rolex watches are getting cheaper because there's suddenly a lot of them available. So, yes, we are seeing signs that things might not be going so well in the economy, just like our theory suggests. One of the big signs that the economy is having a tough time is when the things people want and need become hard to get. Just looking at prices going up on a chart doesn't tell us why things are expensive or if they're too expensive compared to what people earn. Let's take housing, for example. Right now, about 90% of people who have mortgages are paying interest rates lower than 5%. If we exclude those with rates between 4 and 5%, about two-thirds have rates below 4%. A surprising 26% have rates below 2.6%. Now, think about this. If any of these homeowners decide to sell their homes and move, they would have to get a new mortgage with an interest rate of over 7%. That makes it really hard for them to sell their homes. So, both renting and buying homes remain very expensive, and the cost of living is becoming a struggle for many Americans. But there's another problem with debt, specifically credit card debt. The number of people who are not paying their credit card bills on time is going up fast. It's now at 2.77%, which might not sound like much, but it's higher than the highest point in 2020 before the printing of more money started. To find a higher rate, you'd have to go all the way back to the third quarter of 2012. This shows that more people are having trouble paying off their credit card debt, especially now that interest rates on credit cards are very high. Here's something else to consider. Banks are making it harder for people to borrow money. 
This is happening at a pace we usually see during economic downturns. In 1990, 2001, 2008 and 2020, banks tightened their lending standards a lot and in 2023, they're doing it again. In simple terms, it's becoming tougher to borrow money, which means there's less money available in the economy and things might start to feel tight financially. There's also a concern about banks facing problems. About 700 banks in the United States are taking on more commercial real estate loans than they should, according to the FDIC's rules. This is something that happens during a boom and it leads to bad investments and misallocation of resources. The damage is already there even if it's not obvious yet. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more weekly investment tips. Leave a comment below. Happy investing.